And now something I've been waiting weeks to bring you. It's the extraordinary Matt Walsh, the man behind the groundbreaking documentary, What is a Woman? What is a woman? Can you tell me that? <laughs> Well, you're at the Women's March. You must have some idea. Please, if, if one person could tell me what a woman is. You are not here for women. We ask you to leave. What is that? A woman is not anything in particular. There is not one particular thing. It could be many things to many people. Some women have penises, right? Some men have vaginas. I like scented candles. And I've watched Sex and the City. Yeah. How do I know if, if I'm a woman? That's a great question. You're not a scientist. You're not a gender studies major. No. How do you know that you're a man? I guess because I got a dick. Can a man become a woman? <laughs> I'm not a woman, so I, I can't really answer that. Women only know what women are. Are you a uh, cat? No. Can you tell me what a cat is? Do you want to tell us what a woman is? This 95-minute documentary is from author, speaker and podcast host Matt Walsh. He also has a book by the same name and he travelled across America and other parts of the world seeking to answer that key question. I began by asking Matt why he made this documentary in the first place. Well, it starts with just recognizing that gender ideology is this pervasive, toxic influence in our culture across the world, across the Western world anyway, and uh, and also realizing that, you know, in, in spite of the fact that it's been so success, successful in claiming so many people's minds, um, it is really quite hollow at its core. And uh, it seemed to me, you know, going back years that just a couple of questions really bring down the whole house of cards, starting with the question, which is in the title of the movie, of course, uh, what is a woman? If you can't define what, a word, what the word woman is, then nothing that the gender ideologues say makes any sense. None of the claims that they make make any sense if they can't define the term. And uh, as we discovered filming the documentary, they, they certainly cannot define the term. No, they can't. Even women at the Women's March were completely baffled by that question and, and didn't feel confident committing an answer. Now, there is a hero that emerges in this documentary. You've said that Scott Nugent is the hero of the film. Uh, let's, let's hear what they have to say. We have five children's hospitals in the United States promoting that. That's a phallioplasty. That's a bottom surgery. We have five children's hospitals in the United States telling girls that they can be boys at $70,000 a pop in a surgery that has a 67% complication rate. That will kill me from infection that I can't sue on we're butchering a generation of children because nobody's willing to talk about anything. Really does take uh, rare courage to, to put yourself out there and, and speak so honestly, Matt, because you know they're going to be attacked for, for telling their story. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, and there's a really interesting contrast between, you know, we talked, of course, to people on both sides of the issue, including so-called experts who are proponents of this stuff. And uh, for them, they were very evasive, didn't want to talk about anything, always acting like they had something to hide, uh, very vague and sort of abstract in their answers. Then we talked to Scott Nugent, and um, it was, it, we just heard the clip there, and she's very open, um, very kind of raw and honest willing to talk about anything, kind of laying it all out there. And um, I do find it to be to be heroic, uh, especially, you know, to go through this, go through the whole process of quote unquote transitioning and then to turn around and warn other people against it. I think that's a really powerful thing. And it's, it's even more, it's more powerful than, because you and I can, can sit, sit here and say, you know, here are the problems with these mm -hmm. kinds of procedures. But for someone who's actually been through it, and kind of cross that bridge for them to turn back around and uh, shout to anyone else who might cross it and warn them against it, I think is even more powerful. So um, that's why I think that, you know, uh, interview in the film was, was really effective. As you mentioned, you spoke to doctors who performed these surgeries, uh, irreversible surgeries on some very young patients. Uh, let's hear from one of those doctors you interviewed. What's the, what's the youngest patient that you've operated on? 
the youngest patient I've done vaginoplasty on um, is age 16. Do you worry that minors just don't understand enough about themselves? They're not neurologically developed enough yet to make permanent life-altering decisions? Absolutely not. Just a very casual, dismissive attitude to a 16-year-old making a decision that is a lifelong decision. There's no coming back from that. Right, there isn't. And, you know, 16 is obviously very, very young, and it's horrific that we're doing that to 16-year-olds. Um, but then you have to consider that, that many times kids are um, being put down this path at even younger ages. I mean, we talked to... A uh, gen, quote unquote gender affirming pediatrician who puts kids on drugs at you know 12 years old, 13 years old. So yeah. um, at, at very young ages, where it, whether it's surgery or drugs that sterilize kids, um, we're being told that the child is quote making a decision at such a young age. But then of course it doesn't make any sense because even the people who support giving uh, sex change surgeries to 16 year olds, if you ask them, well. Should a 16-year-old be able to get a tattoo on their face or anywhere else on their body? Uh, should a 16-year-old be able to buy a gun, you know, buy alcohol? Like any of these kinds of decisions, almost everybody would agree, well, no, that's too young. So um, if it's too young for that, then how is it not too young to make these life-altering permanent changes to your body? Uh, you know, that's, that's the question they never have an answer to. And talking about treatments for, for kids as young as 11 or 12, uh, FINA has uh, handed down its decision to restrict trans athletes from the women's side of the competition, but they did have one exception if someone had transitioned, if a male uh, athlete had transitioned by the age of 12, then they would be able to compete in the women's competition. Now, FINA say this isn't to encourage anybody to transition that early and they, in fact, say that's not a good idea. But you see this as almost a validation for transitioning children younger and younger. Yeah, I don't... Uh, I know a lot of conservatives are celebrating this move, but I don't, I don't actually see it as a win. Now, the win would be if the governing bodies over these various athletic competitions, if they just said, hey, you have to be a woman to compete against women, period. It doesn't matter when you transition, doesn't matter anything else. You have to be a female to compete against women. Now, that would be a win for sanity and for just truth and moral decency. But that's, not, that's not what's happening here. All they're saying is, well, you have to, you know, if, if a male wants to compete against women, he needs to start his transition younger, um, which is actually uh, legitimizes childhood transitions, and that's only going to be used by the other side to say, well, see, this is why we got to get the kids on the drugs as early as possible so that they're not left out of uh, opportunities later in life. Um, that's, you know, that's that's maybe looking at it as glass half empty, but that's also how I think uh, it's, it's going to be used. Oh, gosh, I hope that's not seen or interpreted that way, but I can understand why, why you have that fear. Um, now, back to what is a woman. Uh, you spoke to plenty of experts, and some of them <laughs> were triggered by the strangest things. Even the word truth was seen as triggering and transphobic. Let's have a look. Well, I'm not even talking about social context. I'm just, I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm really uncomfortable with that language of, like, g getting to the truth. Again, in social why, why life... Is that, why is that uncomfortable? Because that... It sounds actually deeply transphobic to me. Um, and, if you, and, and if you keep probing, we're going to stop the interview. I, if I probe I, about what the truth is? You keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. I'm saying how to is, you... How is the word truth condescending and rude? Why don't you tell me what your truth is, and you're walking on... 30 seconds more of the nights before I get up. Matt, how did you keep your cool throughout these interviews? Because just watching them is maddening. I mean, how can somebody be so offended by truth, by the word truth, by the pursuit of truth? Yeah, it, it was a challenge sometimes. Sometimes a challenge not to laugh in their face. Sometimes a challenge not to scream. 
at uh, the outrageous, ridiculous things I'm being told. But what you just heard there, that, that really, almost every conversation with these people eventually devolves into some version of that. It, 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 you know, you get away from gender and pretty soon you're getting into, well, what is truth? Is there a truth? Wh whose reality are we talking about? I mean, I had that, that, it, that mm. kind of interaction so many times because what you find out is that at, at base, at bottom, all this gender ideology stuff, it's really a war on truth. It's really, um, uh, you know, it really comes down to yes. relativism and the belief that uh, that we all get our own truth and our own reality. And I think that's what that's ultimately what they're trying to defend, I think. Well, it is. It is a denial of truth, a denial of logic, denial of biology sometimes. And and these conversations that you had where you did keep your cool, my goodness, some of them are bordering on the absurd. We've got here another expert who's talking about, you know, whether chickens laying eggs have been assigned a gender. Male gametes. That's what makes me male. No, your, your sperm don't make you male. Then what does? It's a constellation. In reality, in truth, okay? Whose truth are we talking about? The same truth that says we're sitting in this room right now, you and I. No. You're not listening. If I, if I see a chicken laying eggs and I say that's a female chicken laying eggs, did I assign female or am I just observing a physical reality that's happening in the world? Does a chicken have gender identity? Does a chicken cry? Well, Does chick a chicken commit suicide? Let's frame with... it. Because you're talking, you're trying well, a chicken to... chicken has sex like any, like any biological organism. A chicken has organism. an assigned gender, but a chicken doesn't have a gender identity. So we assign female to chickens when they lay eggs? That's a, we that's... assume they're female if they lay eggs. Oh, goodness me. Now, Matt, there was a time when this sort of ideology was confined to university campuses and people thought, oh, well, you know, that's where you debate these sort of radical ideas. But this uh, movement has got enormous disproportionate power in just every facet now. You look at not just public institutions, but private institutions, the number of corporates that virtue signal about this issue. Yeah? Can you just help us understand the power of this uh, activist group, uh, such a small group, but with such disproportionate influence and power. Yeah, that's one of the reasons we, we made the movie, really, was for people to understand just how powerful this ideology is, how widespread it is. And, and that's one thing I've heard from people who've watched it is uh, lots of people have told me, well, I didn't realize how bad it was until I saw the film. And that's not the only thing I want people to take away from the film, but that is one of the things I want them to take away, is, is that uh, this is not just something out on the fringes or, as you say, just in the universities anymore that we can ignore. Um, it is everywhere. And I think what happened is, you know, it seems like it, it came out of nowhere five or ten years ago, but, um, but it really didn't. It made its way into the institutions, especially academia, um, you know, government, mm. media. It made its way into those institutions over the course of decades. And then from there, I think, filtered down into the general population. And then maybe, you know, eight, 10 years ago is when it kind of had a, it exploded onto the, the scene on a mainstream level. And, um, and now, you know, you go anywhere and, and at least you go anywhere in the Western world and uh, people are impacted by these ideas. And many people have bought into them without even realizing that they, that they have.